Hey guys, so Jacob found me out. I live in my parents' basement. It's very unfortunate. I work at McDonald's, at China Star Dishwasher. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to make this video and in Texas, we don't even have basements. I don't know if I've ever been in a home in Texas with basements in them. I think this is one of the most ridiculous tweets I've read to attack Jeremy in his argument. Uh, Jacob is a college student, I believe. He is probably on student loans and are his parents' money. And for him to go make this argument, I'll just read it for you. In my case, everything is out in the open. I'd love to see some of Jeremy's supporters get out of their parents' basements and tell us who they really are and find out what very moral people can do. Yeah, all right, I'll bite. I will bite on this one. So I made a previous video kind of laughing at how ridiculous this is. In law school, I went to top 30 law school one of the things you learn is an ad hominem attack is for really desperate people who cannot win their argument on its face. If the argument is background checks for judges, then an ad hominem attack would be Jeremy's a bad person and because Jeremy's a bad person presenting this argument and he's vengeful, he's doing out of spite, this argument should not exist or this argument is bad because Jeremy is bad. That is a very, very, very bad mistake. But he, Jacob, takes it one step. I mean, he takes it to the extreme. I've never seen an example where not only are you at using an ad hominem attack on Jeremy, you're using an ad hominem attack on the next level of Jeremy's supporters by saying because they live in a parent's basement, they can't have correct opinions. Number one, not everyone lives in their parent's basements. In fact, I'm almost certain that the other side generally lives in the parents' basements. Like I know Weds, doesn't he shoot most of his videos from his parents' basement? Uh, someone correct me if that is, someone correct me if, and I will apologize in the comment section if that's not true, but from what I know, I'm pretty sure that's what where he shoots all his videos. So, okay, I'll bite. Uh, when I was 21, I passed my patent bar exam. I graduated from NYU with 3.7 something GPA. I have the New York University, what is it? The Founders Day Award. I got to go to Ghana, Africa for free and, I, and do charity work, which was fantastic. I loved it. That was Accra, Ghana. I, had, I was there for the 50 year anniversary of independence. Pretty sure it's 50 year. Either 50 or 100, I want to say 50, and it was such a great event to help schools and do things of that nature. I also went to China. I am Chinese. I was born in Shanghai. And I got to go to Italy, Florence, London, and all these fun places with a bunch of my friends. I had a really good time in college. But when I was 21, when I was 18, I started working at a patent law office where the office is One Penn Plaza. You can Google One Penn Plaza. It's right next to Madison Square Garden, like right next to it. My corner office overlooked Madison Square Garden. And yes, I have pictures on that on my Facebook because even as you know, 18, 19 year old, I knew that was kind of special. And what did I do? Like, you know, patents, trademark, copyrights. I wasn't a patent agent until I was 21 because I didn't pass my patent bar exam, which is a very young age to do so. But I was doing copyrights and trademarks because that was, you know, it's a little more, it's called soft IP as opposed to hard IP, which is patent. So everyone begins with soft, quote, soft IP. And I did that when I was 18, 19, 20, 21. I became a patent agent and then I went to off to law school I went. I also taught 14 chemistry. I was a teaching assistant to 14 chemistry classes. That is unheard of. NYU, that is still the record as an undergrad. I was teaching people way older than me. I was a sophomore and my first recitation, my first class as a teaching assistant for everyone was way older. 
And during the summertime of my junior year, I had something called postbox. Everyone was a postbox, so everyone was like 25, 26, and I was like 20. And it's like, oh, you know, cool. My birthday is coming up. Man, I can't wait to be 21. And they're like, mm, okay, he'll get over it. RTA is kind of weird. And that was a great time. I also was an orientation leader, so I got, I got to be very social. I got to be on stage all the time doing really, really boring. Like I had a comedy routine, then I had a dance routine, then I had a, a joke. It was like not a comedy. It was like cosplay routine. Then there was another dance routine that I was part of. I mean, I just love the stage because... I was not popular in high school. I was bullied in high school. I was bullied in middle school. I was bullied in elementary school. And to to go there and to learn how to be a leader, to be an orientation leader, to be a teaching assistant, to operate a law firm essentially at the age of 21, I learned leadership. That's the only skill set that I really learned was not like about organic chemistry and all that stuff. I can't do any of that right now. It was how to be a leader, how to be a, how to motivate other people to work with you. And that's kind of why I knew I eventually I wanted to own a business. I wanted to have other people work for me that I could train. I take a lot of, I take a huge, I've hired gas station cashiers. I've hired cleaning people. I've hired my lawnmower guy, his son was interning. I, I'm tomorrow, so the, this video is being made Friday, so tomorrow's Saturday at 10. There's a guy who's a music major, and he wants me to you know, mentor him and how to become do do music because he knows that I have some connections with artists, and I'm not going to mention their names, but it is astounding. I don't live in my parents' basement. I've never lived in my parents' basement. And I, when I, ever, I graduated, I had my own apartments. Uh, I did live on, quote, campus for a year at the law school. But yeah, everything has come pretty. I'm very fortunate and I'm very grateful. And I always try to give back. Uh, one of the things I try to do is I try to hire people who are in very tough circumstances of life. And I give them an opportunity because if you train them and you give them a chance and they, and I'm a very good judge of people. That's why when I say, how much do you know about Tolarian? How much do you know about Weds? It's because it's really, really easy. So if you went to the college website that Tolarian is, you can still find his name. He's still, According to website teaching at that community college, uh, one of the subscribers gave me a link to it. I clicked on it. I couldn't believe it. There he was still on the website. Maybe he should have been taken down from the website. Maybe he shouldn't have, but I don't know. He's still on the website. I would, if I were him, I would ask to be taken down because it's not a good look. At the core end of the day, I wanted to create my own family. That's what I wanted. So I, I mentioned my significant other. Uh, she is in San Francisco. I used to live in San Francisco, and we still have a place together there, and we have a place in, in Houston. We are not married because we get pen if we we are two people without kids. But I'll get to what our kid who our kids are. They're our foster pets. Uh, oh, here, actually, we got to them kind of early. In 2017, I calculated how much money I spent on foster pets, and it was almost $5,000, which is a lot of money for foster pets. And not just the money. This is just the money, but the time. When you get a foster pet, A, they're very scared. B, they may have been in the wild. They have all types of heart worms, round worms, tube worms. Like, my gosh, like, every type of worm it, well. Luckily in Houston, my uh, backyard froze. You know, normally in Houston, it's really bad because the worms never go away because it never gets to freezing. But luckily this season it did. And now I probably, my backyard is a lot less toxic right now than it previously was. So how much do you know about your favorite YouTubers? How much do you know about me? Like probably not very much. I am a really tough boss, but that's because I have to be. Again, people, it's a gas station cashier that I'm trying to train. I'm trying to change her life. I'm trying to tell, teach her. Most of our 
workers have, do not have college educations. They do not. Most of our workers have interesting circumstances where, which makes them unemployable in practically everywhere else. And this is the one chance they have to really learn a skill, which is digital marketing, photography, social media, all of this kind of PPCs, SEO. And I like taking chances on people. I like t taking chances on animals. And I actually, um, I adopted Bingo, who was a, because no one wanted to take Bingo. Bingo, Bingo has a lot of health issues. He's a mutt. I mean, he's kind of like a miniature mutt. I mean, so one of the interesting parts about me, and if you made it to this video, then you deserve this little tidbit. And I think that will really tell you who I am is I did grow up, grow up with a lot. I didn't grow up poor. I, my dog, my original dog, Norman, he's a purebred Australian shepherd that we bought from a very fancy puppy farm, which now, I, now I'm very against puppy farms. I love Norman to death, but I don't think I would ever buy another dog from a puppy farm knowing that there's so many other good quality dogs out there who need homes. What I do is I foster the home, I foster the dog, I give him, you know, I give him classes, I treat it, and then it goes to a different home. I promote this on LinkedIn. I promote this on my personal media. My LinkedIn is incredibly strong and people will fly from Switzerland to adopt some of the dogs that I heal. And then it's a great conversation. It is, um, it's very rewarding to me. So those are my kids. That's my significant and other, we don't have kids and we don't want kids and we don't want to get married and it doesn't, we're very logical people. So it doesn't make sense economically for us to get married because we would be taxed to oblivion, but we have fosters and I actually, a lot of my employees, it's not that they're foster dogs. I'm, I view them that way, but a lot of them need, they need help. And I'm willing to provide that. I'm willing to provide training. I'm willing to provide resources. I'm willing to send them to school. And I do so not because I expect a return. I do so because eventually, you know, the loyalty component is very important to me. I had employee Jessica, and she's our best employee by far, so our most productive, most um, margin heavy employee, margin meaning profits. She had an offer from Facebook. She turned it down to keep working with me, and that's the loyalty I want to have in my employees. Now, does that always work? No. Amy, I don't know if you guys remember Amy. Uh, Amy was like last January, almost a year ago. See, we taught her how to kind of speak. We taught her how to present. We taught her, we taught her how to do digital marketing. And in 120 days, she was gone. I wrote her recommendation for T-Mobile. So there you go. Like I knew we had a talk and I knew that she came from an Asian family. And Asian families tend to really put emphasis on stability as well as salary. And I told her, you know, I'm going to help you get this job. And I wrote the recommendation and I took the phone call and I said, Hey, you know, you know, I, it would be a mistake on your part not to hire her and we would be losing such an asset. And I trained her myself. And then they looked, I know they looked because link, my LinkedIn, I don't know if it's premium, not premium, but it tells me like when someone looks, the CEO of that division, he looked at my, res, he looked at my articles, he gave it like a thumbs up. He was looking at my profile because he was basing his hiring decision on, okay, who's this guy who trained Amy? Wow. Okay. He's the real deal. He's the real deal. I'm going to hire Amy. Amy got hired. We had, we had dinner two months ago and it was a really fun dinner. Uh, obviously I pick up the tab. One of the interesting parts I do is if, um, if I have a previous vendor or employee and then they go off somewhere else, I will say you owe me because I trained you and then we'll go to a restaurant and I'll, I'll kick up the tab to like something ridiculous. Like sushi restaurants are really easy. 
or like steak restaurants. And then I'll pay for it, right? It's already prepaid. So they're worried, they're sweating, right? Because this is like, uh, it's getting out of their price range of what they expect it would be reasonable. And then I'll be like, all right, so, and then they'll go out and try to pay, it, but I've already paid it. So, yeah, <laughs> it's because um, I typically take them to restaurants I've been to before where I know the, a server or the owner a little bit. And I'll just give them my card and say, hey, can you just run this card when it's over? And that's what happens. So I see them sweating and they're a little nervous, right? Because <laughs> they're like, oh my gosh, this tab is over like two down, like $100, right? This tab is over $100. Oh my gosh, this tab has become over $200. Why did he get two dozen oysters, right? For $18.99. Like, I, I can see it. And I just like to play with that a little bit because then, but then I pay for the tab. And I say, okay, you know, having you be part of my company was reward enough because you did really good you did a really good job and you deserve to go where you're the most happy and if i can see that you're the most happy at t-mobile why would i say not not to go anyway 16 minutes in and that's a little bit about me i'm sure that jacob jacob really wanted to know about me so why not jacob do you want to make a video jacob i'll post it on my channel bye